pan de lujo. All right, so here's a little bit of advice to diners. When you're sitting down and a server is explaining a menu to you and they mention something that's outside of your price range, what you don't do is get all offended. Oh, <laughs> no way. You know, we're not buying that, right? I love the, the, the gigglers, people who look at me and they giggle. They go, <laughs> seriously, it costs that much? I look at them, I go, yeah, what are we talking about here? You know what I mean? Dude, I paid almost $30 the other day for avocado toast. Okay, three little pieces of smoked salmon. Not even like a whole sheet of smoked salmon, just three little pieces. It's an expensive town, dude. You know what I mean? Like, you're taught in this city to not judge anybody by the way they look, by how they sound, how they're dressed. Because a, a good quality guest can look like anything, right? Normal. But when you act like that, it's hard for even an experienced server to not think of you as a cheap fuck. And let me tell you something, bro. Once we put you in our minds, once we identify you as a cheap fuck, you're out on an island somewhere. Like, we've marooned you out on an island. Like, you're a leper, dude. Nobody wants to touch you. Good luck getting back from that one, right? So what do you do in that situation, right? What you do is you act like you've been somewhere, okay? If you don't like the way something sounds, let it go in one ear and out the other, right? We'll walk away. You order whatever you're comfortable ordering, and guess what? We'll all get on with the rest of our lives. Sounds good? Don't get on that island. Yeah? Start it up. Here. Don't get on that island. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Fancy Bread Podcast, where we talk all things restaurants. I'm one of your hosts, Adrian. I'm your host, Ed. And today we want to talk about a series of episodes that we're starting about why a restaurant is so expensive. And today we want to talk about the food aspect of it. And for that, we have brought here Chef David who is uh, currently an executive chef at a multi-million dollar steakhouse. Multi-million dollar! And we're going to have this conversation about why is food so expensive in a restaurant. Okay? Good afternoon. Thank chef. you for having me. Thank you for coming, man. Chef, chef it's an absolute pleasure. And of course, <laughs> as it is customary, tell us a little bit about your story, Chef. How do you get into this industry? A little bit about your encounters around the way, and how do you get to where you are now? Well, I started in, the, in this industry 18 years ago. I believe that I've been always blessed because I always knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a chef. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, definitely, I didn't know what I was in for, but I wanted to be a chef. And, you know, nowadays I'm living my dream, right? As you said, uh, I get to be executive chef in one of the most successful steakhouse over here in, in Miami. In the country. Uh, in the country as well. Um, you know, I had multiple opportunities to sit at the table with great individuals. And I had, you know, multiple conversations like this with, with, with people from my industry. So it had brought me definitely, you know, different places, places where I never thought I would be. Uh, and it had taught me a great deal about human beings <laughs> and the hospitality industry. Jesus <laughs> Christ. <Whoa. laughs> Passionate down there. Holy shit. Right? It's like ready, ready Antonio, to talk about Antonio Robbins is here. There you go. <laughs> Antonio <laughs> Robbins over here. Ready to talk about chip fox. Holy <laughs> shit. This motherfucker's inspirational, bro. I love it, man. I love it. All right, so that was there a great show. Thanks for joining us. You know, you might as well end it, bro. <laughs> right? How do we get better? Right, here, drop I the feel mic. warm down here. Like a, like it's a not warm just piece of wine. bread that just got to your table. You Don't know? talk there to me. There you go. Mom. Don't talk to me. Don't talk to the bread, bro. Go ahead, eh? What do you want to talk about? Okay, so let's put it in the concept that many any of the viewers might understand yeah they go to a restaurant they open up a menu they see a dish that they might commonly do at their own house and they see that is i'd say five six seven times the price that they might think that it might cost them to make it at home and they open up those eyes and they look at the server and the server puts them on the island and you're like why why this is this cost as much right let's say you go to costco for example and you buy a bag of scallops and then you go home, cook it with some butter, a little bit of garlic in there. You make a side of mashed potatoes or whatever you want to do with it. And then you put it in your plate. You enjoy it. And that, if you average it out, it didn't cost you, what, $20? It cost you a couple of if bucks. If you average it out, right? A couple of dollars it cost you. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> but then, you go, to, but then you go to a steakhouse <clears throat> and they charge you $40, $50 for that dish. And let's give them an idea as to maybe why does that... Happen. Why start is, with yeah. Sourcing. Why the fuck is food and restaurants so expensive? A lot of people are wondering. I mean, yes, I think I think it's it's a question out there. It's a common question. People have asked me, you know, these plenty of times, uh, which I think is surprising that up 
you know, to this day, 2023, people are still very unaware of what goes on behind the restaurants, right? Everybody loves to go to eat. Everybody loves the experience, but no one really asks themselves, why is it that I'm paying? Why is it that I'm waiting? Why is it that I'm choosing this restaurant, right? right. So let me start by saying, right, there is a multitude of factors that, uh, you know, drive your dish to have the price that it has, right? Yeah. Uh, first of all, restaurants have a, a series of things that they have to pay that will allow us to be open to begin with and serve you that, that meal, right? right? We have rent, we have labor, we have overhead, we have permits to pay, we have taxes, uh, and all of these things can be pretty costly, right? Um, then w- once we are allowed to open that venue and to bring that food in, right, now we bring what we call the expertise, right? Every restaurant has a different, a different type of cuisine, a different type of service, offer a different experience, right? right? And for that, we need to get different expertise, correct? Mm-hmm. So that dish that you say that you go to Costco and buy, you know, a pound for 19, for, you know, 12 bucks, which to be honest, I think the pound of scallops would go around, you know, 18 to 19 bucks. He would know, um, he would know. You know, I would know. This is what, this is what the difference is, right? And you may think that you're a great cook and you may think that you can throw down you know, some, some seafood and some skills over there. Uh, but I assure you that your wife thinks otherwise, mm. right? Your wife <laughs> thinks that you're filling up the house with smoke, right? Uh, she's just watching you cook. because And that scallop smell that doesn't uh, go away. Oh. You, you know, it gets impregnated in your clothes yeah. and in your, you know, in your, in your cushions and, yeah. and everything, in your couch. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, with that being said, right, we, when we design a dish, Right. There is a lot of time that goes into designing and pairing the right ingredients. Right. The right flavors. Right. right? And, and the right looks for that dish. Because people don't understand. It's like when you see a dish on a menu, you see the price. That price isn't arbitrary. It's not just like you picked it out of a hat. You were like, this feels right. Of course. Everything that goes into that dish has affects the price it. of that dish. Oh, sorry. Careful. There you go. Drunk already, bro. Drunk already. There you go. Drunk on scallops. So continue, please. Which, by the way, I just I just checked real quick, and uh, how much is how much? a bag of uh, 1.5 pounds of scallops and Sam's cost you 29.98. A bag of how many pounds? Uh, one, one and a half pounds. One and a half pounds. What is the size of the scallops? Boom. That is a trick question right there. there because you do you know what's the size of the scallops that you eat at a restaurant? Usually, usually six. You ten. Ten. You ten is this big, this big nice scallop. Which means that 10 Round. of them make a pound. Yeah, right. that's what you, whatever means. The yeah. unit right. to a pound. Unit to a pound, correct. So, you look at the size of the pound. It's those little small scallops that mm-hmm. you use usually to make ceviche or, you know what I mean, just smaller. Mm-hmm. So, the scallop that we pick at the restaurant, right, is a scallop that is brought fresh, never frozen, from Maine, where, you know, they harvest diver, them. Diver scallops. You know, diver scallops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the best place in the States to harvest scallops, mm-hmm. uh, right? That's the other thing, too. Even if you go somewhere, even if you go somewhere like Whole Foods or whatever boutique uh, supermarket you have available where you're from, you'll never get the access that a restaurant gets for the food. Yeah, purveyors of high quality foods will always give preference to a a high quality restaurant before they send their food to a a supermarket. Even if that supermarket is quality, it could be 8 out of 10, but you'll never be able to get 10 out of 10 scallops. Unless you have like a license to op- operate a restaurant, absolutely. And right. because you have, you have us there every day, yeah. right? This product comes in every day in a supermarket. It may arrive on Friday or arrive on Monday, and then you go and buy it on Wednesday, right? Still at a good quality. They take care of it very well. But in my restaurant, it comes in every day. It comes in every day. I pick it by hand, and if it's not good, if it's not up to my standards, if it doesn't represent what we do as a concept. We send it back, right? So then we bring those scallops in, in, in the building. I have chefs that are expert to deal with fish, different type of fish. So they take care of these scallops. They clean them. They store them. At night, I have another chef that will, you know, season it and will cook it. Then that scallops is usually served. Let's talk about a scallop dish, you know, served mm-hmm. with uh, parsley mashed potatoes, uh, steamed green peas, and uh, chive and lime oil, let's say, right? And, and a chorizo uh, 
ragu on top. Coño. Right? Let's, that, that's the dish that you eat at Getting a restaurant. Getting hungry, aren't you? That you pay 40 bucks for that dish, right? Mm -hmm. So in that dish, we, for 10 minutes, we just talk about the scallops, right? And how hard it could be just to get the scallops in the building. Yes. Right? Now add the parsley mashed potatoes that we have to make. That came from right? some organic blind but, farmer in California. In California. No, or, or Homestead. Let's say, let's say Homestead. We keep it local. Yeah, homestead, right? which is homestead. very important as well. Right. Which is very important. Some old Cuban lady who's got no feet that of course. goes around the farm <laughs> on crutches and picks them by hand. Go oh, ahead. Picks them by hand, right? right? There you go. You keep account the parsnip. You keep account, you know, the, the green beans that we're blanching earlier. Uh, you keep in account the chorizo that we, you know, flying the dried chorizo from Spain. And then we mix yeah. it. And that preparation has marcona almonds from mm. Spain as well. And mm. we have a few different ingredients that we have to make. So all of those ingredients, we have to kind of like invest, make in bulk. So for every customer, every guest that comes in, we can grab a piece, right? And make the perfect dish for you. Right. And then we have to ensure the quality, you know, of this product. So if anything goes wrong, we're not selling this product. If any of those items that we made and it's just out of date or it didn't taste correctly, it goes to the trash. Yeah, right. right? So and then and then and then I, I love the things. I love how guests sometimes will have the balls because they don't understand it. Part of it is is innocent, right? They don't get it. Correct. But then, like you know, you have this this Cuban woman with no feet who's blind picking parsnips in Homestead. Uh, you know, supplying the restaurant with these things, and then someone a cook comes in into the morning to make sure that everything is great. Then you have another. Then you have another chef at night who's seasoning and cooking these things. And to make that one parsnip addition to the dish that's like a little puree, it takes like 30 man hours to make it. Absolutely. And then you got the cojones that come into a restaurant <laughs> and not only say, oh, why is this so expensive? But instead of the parsnip puree, can I do like uh, like French fries? Fuck you. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, think, I think there's a common mistake that <laughs> a lot of people do, right? They just don't know the experience that they want and therefore don't know what they should pay for the experience that they're looking for, right? right? They feel like they should have the same, the same experience when they eat, you know, not disrespect, a la carreta. There's right? nothing wrong fantastic, with that. Fantastic food and nothing stuff like wrong that. With that. And when they eat, you know, let's say at the surf club over there, you know, in a, in a fine dining restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they judge them by the same outcome. They right. want to, you know, they're paying, they're paying. That's what they know. So they right. want to have the same experience. Right. And it's not like that. They right. need to know that you are paying for the experience that you're going to have, right? Yeah. If you're going to go and fill your belly, your tummy, on, 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 for lunch, right, casual, then you go a place that is accordingly, right? And you pay accordingly. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if you want to have an experience that is unforgettable, you want to go and propose to your wife, you want to get together with your family that you don't you know, ever do and have food that's going to blow your mind, mm -hmm. that you will only find... And get service to match... At, and get service to match. And then that's another I was whole about to kick you out of here, bro. You haven't said a thing about why, the front of house yet, absolutely. bro. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll, touch, I'll touch on that. But mm. if you want to have this experience that is unforgettable, right, the matches, you know, the, 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 the event that you're having that night, and then be treated like a king. Yeah. Right? Be served in a, in a matter that's seamless, that whenever you need that, whenever you need your, set, your next sip, the, the glass of wine is filled right there, mm -hmm. right? When you needed a, a, a napkin, the server swiftly, you know, slipped in a napkin right there for mm -hmm. you. Which are all things that were also curated as well to be part of that experience. Because uh, I want to twist it real quick into what you were mentioning about the fact that you might go to two different restaurants and expect the same experience. And that is, I actually think that that's very wrong of anyone to do. Because when you go to any restaurant, instead of saying, oh, I wonder if this dish is going to be better than the dish that I usually have in this other place. Or is it going to succeed the dish that I had in that other place? Because that was the best, that dish that I ever had. Then you're doing yourself a disservice. Because when you go to a restaurant, what you want to do is say, I want to try how this chef wanted to play with this ingredient. That's right. I want to see Absolutely. this interaction with that particular dish that I will never be able to have anywhere else. Because this right. is what makes this restaurant this place. Right. Absolutely. And then when you have it, you say, that was nice or that wasn't nice. And then you might say, I very much enjoyed the other one better. But you never should be trying to compare those. Apples to apples. Because, exactly. Because it's completely different. And that goes into 
the creation of the dish. Because another thing that's very important that contributes to the factor of why a dish is so expensive is all the time that it took for you to create that dish. To get it because correct. If you say, because you think, oh, they have a special today. They probably just came up with it and they're just trying to get rid of stuff. To create a dish in a multi-million dollar restaurant, it goes months sometimes just Absolutely. for you to create that dish. And it's just trial and error and trial and error. Right. And then you put the dish with the parsnip puree and then you have three or four people that are very crucial to taste that dish and they say, mm. No, that parsnip doesn't I was going to ask you. And then you have yeah. to slightly switch that. Right, and then from right. parsnip, you go to cauliflower puree. And then they say, no, the cauliflower puree is too muted. And all these, it has to constantly change and adapt to cater to as many palates, but at the same time, give anyone that comes to the restaurant an experience of this is what this restaurant's about. Because there's always an underlying theme that you can find in in, the, in our dishes as well. Absolutely, and it's and, and that's something that people just people eh. people take for granted. People Change just, for, just for, don't know, you know, the process of putting a dish out there, right? And whether whether you find to not like a dish at a restaurant, there are many other dishes that change people people's life. That people try and go to a restaurant every day. Every week, the same day for 20 years. And nothing's ever the same after you try it. You know, and nothing is ever the same. Yeah, man. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. why, you yeah. know, every time you try food from your home country or your mom or your family, mm. it brings you to such a different place. Right. Right? Because food has that power. It does. Yeah. It's right. magical. Also, it's I mean, magical. It's be corny, but it is. It is. It does have some kind of intangible. Absolutely. Thing. And since we're talking about consistency, uh, that's also another thing that adds value to your dishes. Because let's say that you go to a particular restaurant that uses one ingredient in particular for that for this dish. And this dish is a statement or a staple in that restaurant. And throughout the whole year, that certain ingredient might become a bit more expensive because it's more difficult to source. Because what is doing very well in this in, in the season of winter is actually a little bit more difficult to acquire during summer. So that ingredient might also be more expensive Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Consistency is one of the sort of most underappreciated things in a restaurant. It's actually one of the hardest things to do. Because, I mean, think about it. Think about all the factors that can lead to the different taste in a dish. Like, all right, the, the chef is seasoning a dish, and, you know, his wife cheated on him, so he throws a little more salt in than he's supposed to. Of course, the consistency not enough salt. is our everyday battle. Bro, listen to me. The, the fact, people don't understand. Talking about things like Carreta, or the exactly. people don't know, it's just a casual restaurant. The fact that you can go to a McDonald's and have a Big Mac. The bag you, in Miami, you go to McDonald's, have a Big Mac, Right. And yeah. then get on a plane, fly to Japan. And right? have the same Close Big Mac. your eyes and have a Big Mac. Same fucking You feel price. like you're having it in Miami, bro. Absolutely. People don't understand how difficult that is. Yeah. It's extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult and it makes a brand, such as McDonald's, exactly. as powerful as it is. Right. You know, chef, we strive to be consistent, not on flavor, but on experience. Right. Right. On, on criteria on mm. standards, yeah. right? So that will make that no matter, you know, what's the mood of the chef that's walking in that building making that dish, you always have a sous chef, a head chef, mm. that its job is to vet every dish that goes out of that window. Right. You know, to calibrate uh, the troop, the line cooks uh, at the beginning of the service to be able to, to make sure that everybody's in tune, right, right with the goal for that day. It's an mm -hmm. everyday battle, right? So as a chef, there's many things that come into putting this dish together to maintaining it mm -hmm. and to making sure that this dish is, is successful. As you were saying, before it goes into the menu, it goes, we have to make it probably 30, 40, 50 times. We have to get it tried by, you know, 15, 20 people that's, uh, you know, among servers, people that's on top of us, corporate chefs, GMs, people that's around the restaurant, some guests. That's why sometimes we run as a special to Just be to able to have, think, yeah. to, you know, to be able to get the feedback. Right. And through the chef expertise, you know, the top process and the exercise and the staff and the guest feedback is when we make a dish and this dish has an opportunity to be successful. Mm. It's not just a dish that uh, we came out with two days ago and it went on the menu and now, you know, you're paying $50 to have it, right? Yeah. It, it's yeah. definitely a, a lot of work. Definitely um, not in a special or high caliber restaurant, obviously. We high quality yeah. restaurants. That's what we're, talking, that we're talking about. And that. then <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about the overheads, right? 
because this is another another thing that people take for granted. Right. When you sit down uh, at that nice table, right, and you have the perfect lighting, and you have the music in the background, right, and you and the decor matches, right, the the, the you know the the Amalfi Coast in Italy, or it matches the inside of a jet, you know, that's cruising through Atlantic, right. That costs money. Oh yeah. Right, and that money is built into the dish as well, right? Correct. That that right. For you to have the experience that you have and not notice, right? Or actually notice that you left your house, you know, for the weekend and you went somewhere special, that costs money as well. Yeah, it's like when you're like, oh my god, I feel like I'm in like a French place. It's all well. And listen, if you want to stay, or if you, you gotta, gotta pay. pay. <laughs> if you feel like, oh, I'm like, you know, I'm like a trattoria right now. I feel like I'm in the middle of Spain or in Italy. It's the the idea right. of transporting you somewhere else. You think this shit is by accident? Cost money. You think Absolutely. you think this is an accident? You think there aren't people trained, hired? Paid to make you f to transport you to another world, like even if just for a moment, <laughs> and you still want to change the parsnip. What the fuck's wrong with you, bro? Correct. So look, you implied that in order to make a dish, yeah. you have to go through a lot of you have to jump through a lot of hoops. Yes. Is it ever frustrating to you when you, as a creative culinary professional, you say, "I know this is going to work. I know the numbers on this dish. It can work for the restaurant. It's it's beautiful. It's delicious." And you present it to your superiors, which from what I've heard seem to be very many, yeah. a lot of superiors, <laughs> when your dishes are shot down. Yeah. Does that ever happen to you? And if it Absolutely. has, how does it make you feel? Absolutely. We all win and lose. Right. Right. This is, this is the name of the game. True. Right. When I said, it, you know, around 20 people, they're not all superiors. Right. These people include servers. Right. Right. Include, uh, you know, other type of stuff. How they you, cooks impre how they like you imply we're not superiors. <laughs> well, right. It's uh, but, it, you know, these 20 people is for us to bring the feedback. Now, does it frustrate me when something that I want, get, well, I want to get through, I want to get a proof, doesn't? Uh, it kind of times, I think through the experience you learn that is a process of self-growth more than, uh, you know, taking the feedback is, is self-constructing uh, and self-building more mm -hmm. than just getting shut down, right? right? So the truth is not absolute, mm -hmm. right? Especially on a dish that is, it's an art that lasts five minutes when it's in front of you after you eat and it's done. And uh, you have to understand that the, the, the feedback is part of the dish, mm -hmm. Right. So if I make a dish that only I think is fantastic, right. but I have 10 people telling me, hey, I would change this. This doesn't really go good. You know what I mean? This, I wouldn't really choose to go with this ingredient. Mm -hmm. And especially if these people are experts as well, and I respect their expertise, right. it would be just crazy. Bananas for me not to listen to. I get that. That sounds really so, sweet and romantic. And I think we all appreciate and believe, right. believe you. But yeah. do you ever say fuck you, bro? Absolutely. All right, that's all I wanted to do. Absolutely, absolutely, because it comes, you know, it, that's it, all I it, it to is know. so but why? Because it's right. so detailed, right? Let's say, again, I give these people to twenty I give this dish to 20 people, mm. right? Let's say six of them, you know, no, 10 of them, it's a home run. They right. like it, wouldn't change anything. Okay. On the other 10, six, you know, they're okay with it, mm. you know, and other four. Just, you know, don't understand it, don't like it, right? right, right. So what I take into consideration is, mm. out of these 10 people, right, what is it that they do? And obviously they're always related to, to you know, to the industry, but what's their expertise, right? And then I take everything with a grain of salt, right? right? Definitely if it's a guy that has given me an advice, but his base, right, is not really well constructed, you know, I'm going to take the advice or the feedback of the corporate chef right. that's above me, I think, a little more than the advice of, you know, the dishwasher that's tried the, the, the dish and I, you know, and I, his advice, his feedback is important, but the one from the corporate chef may be, you know, influenced a little more. Right. So let's say we get past that. Yeah. And everybody likes the dish, but I still need to get the approval, right? Those that are above me that have a, a more strong saying right. uh, on, on what's approved or not approved. And it comes down that the dish is perfect. It's just that green leaf that needs to be changed for the perfect Leaf and we just can't find it. Right. Can't find the leaf that makes my chef happy. Right. Right. Can't find, you know, that sauce. You know, God. the sauce is perfect, but the thickness is not, it's just, you know, needs a little more. And what is that a little more? Right. Right. So those, those moments, those situations is where it can get a little more frustrated when mm -hmm. you present it 
two and three times, and it's perfect, but it has that one thing. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but oh, when you find that one thing, it's a beautiful moment. It's well. a beautiful moment. I was just going to say, because <laughs> uh, something that I, that I learned is that you can't please everybody. It's impossible. You can't save everybody. And usually, like you said, there's those four people that didn't like the dish, they do represent a large portion of the population that will come to your restaurant, try that dish, and feel that way. So it's it's that search for perfection that doesn't exist, but you yeah. still must strive to achieve it that just keeps you pushing and pushing to find the way to pos to to minimize that number from a four to a three or two mm -hmm. two. Absolutely. So that everybody that comes there is like Wow. And even those that don't like it to say, I don't like it. It's not for me, but I understand why everybody else would like it. What are you tired of seeing on menus? What are you just sick of? You're like, I'm tired of this shit, man. Let's move on to something else. Wow, that's 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 a good question. It, mm. it's, it's, it's actually a common question. I tell you this. You know, as a chef that I had the opportunity to work in different types of cuisine and different concepts, mm. you know, I don't I don't think that there is an item that I'm like, okay, I'm tired of seeing, right? I'm, mm. I'm tired of, of cooking with or, or, or I wouldn't touch, right? I think there are some cliche, cliche mm. uh, items like, you know, truffles for some people, uh, you know, scallops for other people or, you know, king crab, Alaskan king crab right. for other people. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I don't really, I don't really can think of, a menu item that I would say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm tired of, or you maybe know, I don't want to see Let me try to maybe rephrase that. What are some yeah. exclusive or rare, in, or rare ingredients that contribute to an elevated cost in a dish? Because that's usually sometimes what happens in some restaurants. There are certain restaurants that I go to, and I look at the decor, and I look that they're very pretty, and because I think, well, someone has to pay for all this decor, that's mm -hmm. probably going to be me, that I know that certain dishes are going to use certain ingredients so that they can boost the price. Of that dish. Huh. And that, to me, becomes a little bit cliche. And I would ask you, as a chef, what would you consider some of those ingredients? Right. Well, first of all, that's not a rephrasing of the question. It's just it's a, a different a, goddamn <laughs> question. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So you could have yeah. just said, let me ask you a different a question. A different question. <laughs> let me ask you a different question. <laughs> right. Real quick to your question. Let's say truffle oil. No one fucking cares about truffle oil. Whoever likes truffle oil is just... It's just I'm sorry, but not very sophisticated. Right? Your palate is just Thank not you. there anymore. Okay? Thank you. Very quick on that. Which, it's by tasty, the way, but just whatever. to to take some people down on that on that tree, most times, truffle oil is actually truffle perfume. Truffle perfume, and you know, some infuse. If you go to a restaurant and it says truffle oil in the menu, and yeah. the dish is not actually very expensive, yeah. you're not getting truffle oil. You get truffle perfume. Just like the majority of the Coffle. wasabi out there, you know, heads up. Okay, majority wasabi. of the wasabi out there is not real wasabi. Oh, it's I love it when guys radish. tell me, "Oh, I go to this one place, Absolutely. real wasabi." The one thing I ask right. him is, "How much? How much was it?" Oh, it was like <laughs> like like a hundred dollars a person total, you know, for the whole meal. I'm like, "It's not yeah. real wasabi." So <laughs> it's not real wasabi. Now, going back to your question, right? What are the ingredients that can help drive the cost of a dish up, right? And on that note, we have you know ingredients that can drive up the cost of a dish, but we also have dishes that drive up the cost of a menu, right? So with ingredients that drive up the cost of a dish, you have the fake booster ingredients like truffle oil, right? As an example, that people, you know, and not to take away from the people that genuinely like truffle oil. I love truffle. I respect you. If you love it, if you love, love it with truffle. your friends and stuff like that, listen, but I have it as well. Not disrespect, but the people that are just faking it, that just want to have it to have it, right? right? To pose that they were having truffle fries. Hmm. So that's a fake ingredient that will bo boost, you know, the price, drive up the price of your dish with not really, with not really uh, value behind it, right? Hmm. Now, there are other ingredients that you do pay. And then now you do pay for these ingredients because otherwise you couldn't even make, uh, get them in the, in the supermarket, right? Mm -hmm. And even if they were in the supermarket, you just don't know how to choose them, how to work with them, and how to, you know, how to serve them. So mm -hmm. that's very important. That's part of the expertise, and that's part of why you pay for a dish as well. So ingredients that can help drive the cost of a, of a dish, caviar, mm -hmm. right? Whenever we do a dish and we top it up with caviar, uh, or you do this sauce, you know, with bird blanc, and they, you know, bait your fish in a bird blanc with caviar on top and stuff like that. That can drive your dish up, you know, 10, 15, 20%, right? 
right? Mm. Um, when you do uh, uh, items like, let's say, uni, mm -hmm. right? And you serve uni and then you do an uni toast or you do a scrambled eggs that is so simple and then you top it up with uni, nice. right? So these are items that can have you paying for eggs and toast, yeah, or certain right? spices like saffron or spice. Or certain spices like saffron. Yeah. So these are items that can have you paying for an egg and toast $38, $40, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So you have to know what you're paying. You have to know what you're getting, mm -hmm. right? Because if you go to a restaurant and you just don't know, you have no idea, you see an egg on toast with uni on top and you say 40 bucks, you're like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. But you have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> but to those who don't know, it's because sourcing these ingredients. Sourcing these ingredients. It's not very right. simple. It's, it's not, not like you simple. just get it all the time. They're yeah. very expensive, yeah. obviously. For those who don't know, truffles, uh, you know, they, they grow on the on the roots of, of certain trees and they find them with uh, either dogs that they train or pigs. And, you know, it, of it's, course. it's actually a, a very hard process for you it's to do. It's a very hard process. <clears throat> it's seasonal. You know, they, we fly them from Italy every other day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the prices go up and yeah. down because there is also a black market on all these things. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so so it's not to say that just because these ingredients are in the menu, it's just it's to gouge yeah. you and Let to me take tell you money out of it. But thing now the, that we talk the, about the reality the is that they are pricey, you and that's the why pigs? they're there. And they do you know make they, it. They you know when they use pigs to scalp for truffles? Yeah. Um, so dogs are easier, like are easier to train, but they don't find the truffles as well. Pigs are the best. Pigs. Yeah. Find the truffles better, but they, they eat, eat them. them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yo, absolutely. Imagine that. So you, imagine if you see a pig full yeah. of with a mouthful of white truffles yeah. on your farm, and he's fucking you like, them. <laughs> you're like, this is gonna make me rich. And yeah. then your pig is just like. So let them. me tell you something. There is something that people is, is you know is very unaware. Of. You don't have to be aware of these things because this you know no one is really aware of these things. But there is a certain time of the year where limes go up. Four times, right, due to the war between the narcos and the farmers in Mexico. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where the avocados, you know, on, a, on the time of the season get so expensive because people is literally killing each other blood over avocado. avocados. Blood, blood avocados. avocados over there in Mexico. So you have to source them from different countries mm. that don't sell the amount that they, send so, that they sell so they're up, the prices go up. Mm. Right, but you still want your avocado toast yeah. on the morning. Right? And you want That's it, why so, I paid thirty dollars for my avocado toast. And you want that consistency, you want that consistency with the flavor. Yeah, right. So achieving these things are, are are it's a hard thing to do. Right, going to that restaurant that gives you the same consistency every day. Believe it or not, it's an army of people behind that avocado toast. That, that you one have in the morning, piece of avocado. That toast. one piece of avocado toast. So real quick, what are some of the dishes that in your menu? So actually, let me ask. Let me ask this one first. On average, how much should you make with a dish? Like if a if a dish costs you ten dollars to make on average, how much should that dish be sold on average? So uh, you have to think. You know. So how you find out the food cost of that dish, right? You grab. What you pay for the dish, what you spend on that dish, you divide it for what you sell in the dish, and you multiply it by 100. So that will be your food cost. Mm -hmm. And that food cost will be determined on percentage. Okay? So, historically, the guide for restaurants' uh, food cost is 28 to 30%. Mm -hmm. That's the markup. So that means that out of everything, every dish that you're putting out there, right? Uh, it should cost you 30%, you know, of what you're selling it for. Correct? Okay. So that 30% is uh, only the food cost. And then, you know, you have the other 70% to divide among the other costs that inquire to open a restaurant. Yeah. Right. We mentioned the rent, the overhead, the labor. Absolutely. As I mentioned, you know, I think I did, we didn't mention this on camera, but it's important for people to know that, the average healthy margin in a restaurant is from 5 to 15%, okay? If we have 30% in food cost and we have 5 from to 15% on profit, let's say it's the healthiest restaurant and it's doing 15% on margins, uh, that's 45%. That gives you another 55% that you're really using to be able to operate that restaurant, right. 
right? Okay. So 30%, it's, it's a guideline. It's not a rule. You know, it depends on the type of restaurant that you have, in the type of venue that you have, mm -hmm. uh, and the type of guest, you know, the type of population that you're directing to, mm -hmm. right? Many restaurants have, um, you know, high ingredients and a high food cost, but they also demand a little more for their dishes, right? right? Uh, other restaurants that have cheap menu items can really charge much for their food, so therefore they, they bank in their volume, mm -hmm. right, in the volume that they sell. So that is, that is your answer in a nutshell. The, the, the food should be, you know, 30% of what you're charging for. On average. That's what you should, on average, that you, you should spend on the dish. Now, does not mean that every dish runs on a 30% um, right. uh, uh, percentage, on 30% right. food cost, because people need to know this as well. There is many dishes that do not make any money on a menu, right? right? That you need to have on a menu... To because please people. To please people, right? We were you were talking about you can't please everybody, everybody but you the hell certainly need to try. What are uh, right? What are some examples of those dishes? Yeah. Some, some examples dishes? of these dishes. Yeah. So we have Alaskan king crab, right? Mm. That's delicious. <laughs> it's fantastic. Right. It, it's <laughs> about it's bad. about, you know, forty five to fifty dollars a pound, right? And we sell at a restaurant, it usually sells for we're talking about a Half a pound, you know, sells for a hundred and something dollars, and right. a pound sells for you know about two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars. What happens, right? That dish is running at a 50, 55 percent. I'm actually paying to have that dish on the menu, right? Right. Uh, but people like to have it. People like to go to a restaurant, and if they're ordering a steak, they're ordering some seafood. They like to be able to have access to a, an item that they wouldn't have in any other market, in any other restaurant, right? right? Yeah. So I have to have it in order to entice my customer, my guests to come into a restaurant. So then you have that stakes, the margin of stakes is very short, very low, right? Especially in big cuts, in large cuts like tomahawks, a uh, porterhouse, uh, you know, rats and stuff like that. So think about it that every time we sell a steak, especially if you're a steakhouse, steakhouse, uh, steakhouse is historically run at a 33, 35% food cost, mm. right? Because they count that steaks make a very, very low margin, right? Where you really make the money is on the sides, oh. you know, on the on some appetizers, on some seafood dishes. Right. That's why our chefs are always, you know, promoting, I'm not going to say fighting, but promoting, Right, and trying to coach servers and, and the serving staff that they need to serve a balance, you know, check, right? When you spill your your menu, when you do your sell, you know, when you when you lead the guests through the dining experience, it has to be balanced. You can't just not go for the high uh, high sell ticket items right. because mm -hmm. it's convenience for your uh, tip or for your you know um, bottom line. Right. But you have to understand that. Managing that table, managing that get experience, that guest experience, with a uh, array of items, right? That help the kitchen and compose because we we make the menu individually, but also collective. Right. For you to have a, a table full of different items that you can that go together, yeah. right? You have to guide them through the proper dining experience. Right. It helps the restaurant. It mm -hmm. helps, you know, the financials of the restaurant. Yeah. Mm. But that goes into also the service as well. So a question that I have taken upon myself to ask the bar and also the chefs is say, what are the dishes that makes us money? And not just to me as a server, Absolutely. but to the restaurant. What, what is a dish that if I sell, you're going to be like, that's good because that, that helps us. Yeah. That, that helps the restaurant, you know, stay operating, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, keep making creative things, or and I go to the bar and I say, whenever we're busy, which is the dish, or I'm sorry, which is the the drink that I can fire that it's going to be the, the quickest for you to bring out. So those are little things that you as a server should know, yeah. so that it it helps you in when you're in a jam, right? If you need something quick, or if you really need to help the restaurant and make money. Um, I think restaurants can do a better job as well, uh, putting this communication out there, yeah. right? Having this interaction with their service in a daily mm -hmm. basis, mm -hmm. right? Of talking about, you know, the health of the rest, the financial health of the restaurant. You know, as you say, where are the dishes that balance out this operation, right. and, and what's the best way to, you know, just to provide the, the dining experience, right? right. Uh, from both ends, right. from right. the server back to the kitchen, 
right? I'm from the kitchen back to the service. Right. So. I think, but a lot, a lot of servers fall into that category naturally because if you want to be a good a good server, you will make a conscious effort. You go to, the extra mile. You want to make a conscious effort to not feel like you're gouging a table, right? If you only mention the high ticket items, honestly, that's just a little. That's just, it's kind of corny, honestly. You have to be well balanced and I mention mean, things that are like high. I bet end. you and I've seen some stuff, some server side. Well, yeah, we, we have the we, dark yeah. side. Yeah, we have seen some <laughs> of the dark side. Uh, but yeah, I think it, 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 it behooves everybody. Obviously, it behooves the bottom line of the restaurant, right. but it also to, to, to be identified in the eyes of your guests as someone who's trying to take care of them and not just take advantage of them. So it works. It's a win-win which, for everyone. Which I think, I think you know, among the serving, the hospitality industry, right? Or mm -hmm. when it comes to serving, it's an important key for you to connect with your table right. and to give a good experience, right? Because I don't want to feel that this server over here is just trying to take my money. Trying away. to abuse me. Yeah, trying to abuse me, right? right? right. Uh, which, but there are many restaurants that are like that. Yeah, ton of right, and people go to these restaurants right. because of that. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, like if if. You just get a glimpse, I mean, and a lot of people will, of how much care and how much thought is put into every dish. Yeah. Just because a dish is not as expensive, it doesn't mean that there ha hasn't been care put into that dish. You know what I mean? Now, I, uh, you know, I ask you this, right? Talk and now that we're talking about, you know, cheapos, uh, and we're talking about people that just don't appreciate or don't know, right, why are they paying what they're paying? Mm -hmm. How many times have you encountered people that come over, come to the restaurant very skeptical about the ambience, the lighting, the food, the price especially, and the service, right? But they walk out blown away. you, blown away, you know what I mean, with the experience of their life and just, you know what I mean? They're, they become your best friends through the experience. Yeah. Right. All the right? Time. How many times? It happens all the all time. time. Right? All the time. Oh, time. That is... It's, it, that's why my, my favorite time is the first bite. That's first one bite. of my favorite moments when, Looking at their when faces, the guests come right? in yeah. and you're like, you, you, you very excitingly recommended this dish that you said, based off my read on this table, this is what's going to make them happy. And you say, you got to start with this. Yeah. Trust. And they have that yeah. bite. And like, if they were upset before they came in, or like you said, skeptical, and as soon as they have that bite and you check on them, they're like... Yeah. 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 I can't, I can't work in a restaurant where I don't have confidence in my kitchen. Number one. So no one where, really talks where, about that. Where I work, I have immense confidence in the quality of the food that comes out of my kitchen. So Absolutely. I never have that insecurity... Where someone comes in and I can tell their vibe is, they're skeptical, they're yeah. cynical of the vibe, especially since if especially if you're a popular restaurant. Yeah, of course, you know, there's gonna be a ton of haters out there. I'm not phased by that shit at all. Yeah, because my kitchen cranks out good shit, and you walk in there confident. It's very important it, because I I, I worked at a place that it wasn't pumping out good food and yeah. it was very stressful for me as a you know, as a server because when people would get their dish. He would look at their face and be like, here we it's go. You would like cross with. your fingers. It's tough to do with. That yeah. honest, that you would think, I hope to God to that they don't have an experienced palate to tell right or wrong from so, this dish. And when they say you like it, I was like happy that I'm like, okay, I guess I'm getting a tip. <laughs> but deep down inside, I'm like, yeah, you don't know the you sure, garbage. You shouldn't you're live with that, with that so anxiety. Having that, it was terrible. So, so that I, right after there. After that, I said never again. So that right there makes it so much easier. Because, right, when you're confident on the food that your kitchen is pumping out, your restaurant, right, or you're confident on the ingredients that these guys are using and the way they're treating and executing these ingredients, mm -hmm. right, many of the guests that come and get surprised for the, you know, for the amount of money they have to pay for the dish, mm. right, that is it's taken out of the table as soon as they try what they're trying, right? right? They usually... Food speaks for itself. Right. Right. In the kitchen, we have this saying, right? Anybody can give you a resume that says that they worked in the best restaurants in the world, right? But as soon as they walk into the kitchen and they pick the knife, we know where they're coming from. Immediately. You know, the way you walk in there, the way you move around, the way, you know, you pick a knife. 100%. We can tell. So yeah. when you're paying for a dish, a lot of money, right? Or you're paying considerable amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and as soon as you try that dish and you see when it comes to the table and as a server, you know, you see that, you, listen, it changed completely. Yeah. Then, you know, it's worth it. This is like we talked about. goes into another point that yeah. you already just mentioned that another thing that adds value or cost to the menu is the person or the people that are working for it. Because if you go to, let's say, a, a, a regular mom and pop shop. You know, they, you, have, you have people that are you know, very humble and are great at their craft, but they're not people that have traveled the world, 
learn with the masters of the masters, work with the most exclusive, unique restaurants out there, and learn how to tailor a dish in a particular way or the knife skills or how to grab things with little tweezers. Like all these minute details Absolutely. that only these, the most skilled people have. Absolutely. That can definitely add a lot of value or expense to a menu as well. Because Absolutely. how do you go about choosing the right people to work in your kitchen? Because you have also another thing that adds value to an expense is the equipment that you have to work Absolutely. with. Absolutely. Because I don't have... The grill that you probably work with at work. You have, yeah. uh, you do, a, I believe you use a, a, a charcoal uh, activated wood grill. Uh, and that's not something that everybody grill. has. At that home. means that we light it up with charcoal and then we fit it wood throughout the night. So it's, it's, it's technically a, a wood grill. And not every steakhouse has that. Some steakhouse I mean, use pans, some steakhouse use salamanders. In your so, house, when was the last time that you were able to use wood to cook a barbecue on a Sunday with your family? Exactly. So right there, <laughs> these are all things that stop add. complaining about the prices of right. right. Food, so no. these are all things that add to it, and people taste it. I'm like, oh my god, what is this taste? That's the wood that was particularly selected to be the blend of the wood to that grill Absolutely. to give you that particular aroma. Absolutely. And Listen, as a chef, as a chef, right? Uh, I technically, I technically get to see, get to impact, you know, the whole operation front and back of the house. I can tell you that the process of getting the right talent, because the word, sorry, the right word is talent. To do this is not only a skill, it's not only memorizing a wine list, it's not only memorizing a dish, it's having the talent to turn a bad experience into a wonderful experience, right? right? The process that we go through to choose these individuals, these individuals and pair them together it's almost magical as well. It right? is, because dude. it's a bunch of in the kitchen, a, a bunch of pirates <laughs> dancing like a ballet, a ballet group, you know, with, with tutus almost, <laughs> right? And on the front, a bunch of degenerates, right, that swiftly move around and dance like a team, right? And give you and take care of you like they were your grandmas, right? It's amazing. So I like to say, we, we did an episode on audio, <laughs> and we called it The Swan. Yeah. The Swan. <laughs> the reason we called it The Swan is because the, the, the sort of philosophy there is that if you look at a swan swimming on water, it just floats. Like, I mean, it's, it's literally one of the pictures of elegance, Sinless. right? Sinless, yeah. But underneath the water, that, that swan's feet are Little going feet crazy, like right? Like a synchronized <laughs> swimmer. And the fact of the matter is there's so much shit going on behind the scene. Absolutely. Right? That you literally don't see or you can't see because there's so many things going on in a service head. Yeah. That we dance this crazy dance, right? This, yeah. this organized chaos for you to sit down and have a good and time. And we also have to have a good time. Remember, if you're a good time and the vibe is pumping and, and the right. food is good and the music is good and right. your server is very nice and everywhere you see people is laughing and having right. a good time, right, 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 right. we are most likely having a great time as well. Right. You know, that it's is, a that genuine is the genuine thing. Yeah. That Listen, is the vibe. Listen. That is what actually yeah. activates you to enjoy Absolutely. the rest of your night. Just you know. because, like I said, at the beginning of the episode, if we put you out onto that island because you're a cheap <laughs> fuck and you're a leper, <laughs> you're alone. it doesn't mean you can't <laughs> swim back. You can Abs find a way absolutely. back to the mainland, but you're out there to begin with because I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And that, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, and ultimately, we're trying to have a good time. Ultimately, we're trying to we, take care of you have and have to, a good time. Because what we put out there, what you're eating, right, is a representation of us, but it also has all of our vibe in there, all of our energy, all of our expertise, all of our love, hmm. right? And for you to have that, Listen, I've been doing this for 18 years, in and out of the kitchen every day, you know, cutting that, cleaning that chicken every day, cleaning that scallops every day, you know, washing that lettuce every day. So believe me, we do it like no one else does it. So, it's so Speaking about ultimately, <laughs> what are some of the financial goals set to the kitchen? What is something that the kitchen can do or what is it that you need to do for your superiors to go, good job, you know? Yeah. What is that goal? Wow, that's that's a that's is it a keeping great it question. below a certain uh, spending limit? What is it that you do that will make your superiors be very happy? Certain margin reviews because to us it right. sells, it sells, 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 sells. That's obviously, it. you know. <laughs> well, you know, to to you guys it sells and, right? and reviews, yeah, and reviews, absolutely. So just like you guys, right? You guys are a part of the operation, and right. there's levels to the operation, right? Mm -hmm. And we all, have, we all have different responsibilities, right? Right. So your realm over here that, that, that has to do with 
uh, the sales and the experience, right? At a bigger level, I'm responsible for the things that I'm responsible and for the things that you guys are responsible as well. Because mm -hmm. on um, some level, I'm also responsible for the sales and the, and the feedback and the guest feedback, right? Mm -hmm. So as a chef, as a back of the house, believe it or not, you know what I mean? We are responsible. The GM and the executive chef run the restaurant as a unit, right? right? So we are responsible for every good or bad review we get whether it has to do with the kitchen or has to do with the service, mm -hmm. right? We are responsible for whether, you know, the servers are selling or not selling, right? But just like every business, right, and, and everybody does their job and there is a piece to the puzzle, my piece to the puzzle also has guidelines and has goals that are given to me through meetings and projections, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think that a chef uh, only has to do with cooking, Right, and this also had to do with you know why you pay what you pay on that dish, right? Um, as a chef, cooking it's a, a small part, you know, of our day to day of our profession, right? We have to do a lot with finances, with uh, staff development, right? You know, with menu creations, mm. with budgets of forecasting, right? With hitting goals, right? With sales strategies, with marketing and photo shoots and, and everything that has to do with promoting. Uh, we're promoting the venue and promoting the sales of the restaurant, right? right? So I tell you, I'm judged by a food cost, mm -hmm. right? So meaning that the overall food cost of this restaurant cannot exceed that mark of 30% that we talk about it, mm -hmm. 28, 30%. I have some room right there. But I can, if the restaurant is wasting too much, if the food is not done consistently, if uh, the food is not taken care, you know, the proper way, mm -hmm. if the vendors are not kept in line, right, uh, that increases my food cost and I'm responsible for that, right? Uh, I'm responsible for uh, the overall health of the staff, right. meaning um, in charge of retention of this staff, development of this staff, mm -hmm. and, and growth of this staff, mm -hmm. as well as keeping uh, the building staffed. Mm -hmm. Meaning hiring, hiring the correct uh, team members, right, yeah. to make this operation possible. <laughs> oh shit! This is going. <laughs> right? This is getting raw. Uh, um, I am <laughs> responsible for uh, to lead uh, every effort, every marketing effort, right, uh, of the operation. So mm -hmm. every time that you see a photo shoot, every time that you see a dish up in the in the in the Instagram on the social media. Most likely, we spent a whole day with the marketing team and the cameras cooking and making these shots perfect, right? So they can be posted and they can promote, right? Uh, I'm in charge of responding to the overall with the GM or the finances of the restaurants. This means we run our operations for a whole month, right? Yeah. Uh, we Every week, we do this amount of sales, this, every week we have this amount of waste. This we the, every week we we have this amount of usage, right? So at the end of the the month, you know, I do inventory every day. I wake up at four at four o'clock in the morning to be right. in my restaurant before everybody's in there and be able to count the restaurant, and then we turn all of this balance sheet to a financial department, right? Where we tell them, well, this is what we count. Mm -hmm. This amount of thousand of dollars is what I have on the building. This is the sales. This is what I purchased throughout the month, right? <laughs> and they get back to us with something called p and &L, &L. Profit and Loss profit Statement, and loss statements, right? Yeah. And that Profit and Loss Statement will have some crazy numbers that you have to understand, right? Mm -hmm. And these numbers go from operational costs, food costs, labor costs, uh, ex external labor, uh, restaurant supplies, everything. Go rent go uh, distribution for the partners, you know, how much the partners, the owners of this restaurant, the guys that we don't see on a daily basis are making. Uh, rent, you know, I already mentioned rent and, and all of these things and they go down to bottom line. So they give, they, they give this p &L to us and then we have to go and dig in this p &L and find, right, the discrepancies and the numbers that look odd so we can go to another meeting and explain these numbers to them. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. So basically, what you just accomplished in doing is every little boy and girl that's out there that's saying to themselves, 
dreaming. I want to become a chef. Oh, absolutely. Saying, I don't want to do this shit anymore. That's basically what you just did. There no. you go. <laughs> no, but I mean, to keep it real, obviously, there's this romanticized notion of, of cooking food or being a chef, right? No, absolutely. So all this, like, you're in, like, Italy cooking and there's an opera singer, right? It's, it's a real fucking thing. It's a, it's a job and a profession that requires not just talent and experience, but when you're a chef at your level, right, you're a cook, Okay, you're a fucking psychologist. Absolutely. You're a relationship counselor. You're an accountant. Yeah. You're a public. You're you're a PR uh, rep. You're a social media Absolutely. influencer. Like what the fuck? You know, you're yeah. in charge of negotiating all these prices with the vendors, and then you're in charge you're in charge of coming up in a creative manner with cost effective, cost and execute an execution effective new dishes for your menu, so you can keep it. You know, that may or may not be approved. That may or may not be approved. Uh, 10 uh, filters. All I'm thinking is after Super all that, entertain. you might need a drink. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> and for that, I want to ask, drink or choice? You want to take a guess? You go first. We have a, we have a little thing. We'll try to guess. <laughs> What's a drink of choice for you here? Hmm. I have a guess already. You have a guess already? I do. Hmm. I'm going to say Margarita. Don't margarita. say margarita. <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm on the not, rocks, salt. No margarita, margarita uh, in a in a champagne flute. Uh, some people <laughs> like it up, puppy. Some people like it up. I'm gonna say a nice cold beer. Listen, you're you're very close. Mm. I'm gonna tell you this: the 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 right recipe, recipe for an after chef drink for chef mainly is a very cold beer and a shot. In oh. my case, it's a shot of mezcal. Boom. There mezcal lovers unite, baby. I feel that. There you mezcal go. lovers, right? Unite. Mezcal lovers united. Listen, it, it's now a what? beautiful thing. Uh, I, you know, many, many things in this industry and in any profession, I, I guess it depends on how you absorb uh, the challenges, right? Uh, I like to see, to look at this in a way, I like soccer, you know, obviously. I'm from South America. Uh, and I... I I look at this like I was this DT, this coach, right? And I was handed this amazing team with all of these resources, right? And all of this talent, and I have to run it, right? So I get the opportunity to run this amazing team with all of this talent and lead it through a championship, right. lead it through a Super Bowl, you know, and every day. You're Ted Lasso. There you go. He's Ted Lasso. There you go. Yeah. Ted Lasso. So that's how I look at it, you know? That's I, what you I'm are. blessed every day to get to do this thing. So we we'll continue to learn. It's that's it's that, having that ability. And speaking about things you do, because other than doing everything that you mentioned, you do have a business of your own, which is... Uh, awesome, apart awesome. from all that apart sh from all that shit, <laughs> he still finds the time to say, I want to do something, but I want to stand out. You want to talk a little bit about the, this tremendous garnish you got? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, a few years ago with my brother and business partner, Fantastic dude. He works in the industry as well. He's a mixologist, you know, bartender. Uh, he came up, right? And then we partnered up. He came up with this product called Tremendo Garnish. Tremendo. Tremendo Garnish. He saw, you know, the need in the industry uh, throughout working, you know, in the industry uh, of creating uh, these garnishes to help in, you know, the industry to create these garnishes. So we came up with Tremendo Garnish again. Tremendo Garnish is a... Dehydrated garnishes that you can put in every cocktail, right? We work with uh, companies from hotels to restaurants to distribution companies to airlines to mm. um, to cruise ships. You know, everyone that has a drink, we secretly, you know, are trying to get in every drink in, in America, right? It solves a, a bunch of problems um, with the industry, and, you know, space, storage, uh, consistency, you know, before you could only make a hundred of, of these garnishes and, and sell it on a day. Now you can sell throughout the weekend in your event, in your festival, three thousands of the same drink of the same drink with the same garnish, right? You right. don't have to worry about your bar back spending twelve hours back there, you know, slicing it, flipping it, making it right, wasting this bunch of fruit that you can really use, you know, the next day. That increases your cost. Increases your cost, fighting with your chef for the space in the cooler. There is none of that, right? Mm -hmm. Most importantly. One of the biggest uh, pain in the asses for our, our industry, the health department uh, and the fruit flies. 
With this, right. you minimize the amount right. of fruit flies because you don't have sugar laying around your bar. Right. Right. Um, and are all your all your products from Tremendo Garnish are they cruelty free or do you get them in from the, the guerrilla warfare areas? They are they are the cruelty world. free. Fantastic. We work with Thank local uh, farmers over here from Florida. You know, they get they get us fresh oranges, fresh right. lime, fresh uh, lemons. We slice them in our warehouse. Right. And they're ready to just put in your drink like this. Right. You know. And can you eat any of them? You can eat them. You know, the, the dragon fruit. What is this dragon fruit? That is dragon fruit. Yeah. We put can I taste one of these? Absolutely. You open it. It comes in a Ziploc bag that you can open, you know, and close back up and save it for the next day. You know, what? Have a long, a long shop life. So and lasts very up important to because, months. as you know, in the industry that is it, that, guided that by thing, baby. Instagram is that presentation is look everything. At this, look at this beautiful thing. <laughs> Tremendo. Now you Tremendo. have a cocktail that's $16 now. There you go, baby. Tremendo garnish. <laughs> get, that, get those managers happy. Mm. Oh, dragon fruit. Wow. That's actually really good. Wow. Uh -huh. Wow, it's really good. The pineapple is fantastic. You know, since yeah. that since the bag is open, you know, you might want to just leave it here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, for but sure. Also for you guys, so you can have them. You know, next time you invite a drink, you can you know you can put it on. on Tremendous guys, guys, you got it. Like uh, where can we get this, chef? Like, if any restaurant owner right now is looking at this, or anyone that has a little food truck or anything that says, you know, I want to I want to have some of this, we're gonna get it. Absolutely, we're gonna put our information down below, but. Uh, Tremendo Garnish uh, on Instagram. Uh, TremendoGarnish.com is our website. You can get through our website. And then, you know, in there you'll see the phone numbers that you can order Tremendo Garnish. Next day, delivery if you're in Florida. We ship it all over the states. And, and yeah, you know, great product, great quality. Uh, people from the industry, you know, product from the industry to the industry. Coño, that's right, cool, bro. So, what you learned from this episode, my friend? What did I learn from this episode? What did I learn from this little chat, as you would say? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be a fucking chef, bro. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> That's what I learned. That's, I, did, I learned that uh, the, the, the intense appreciation that I have for people's hard work uh, and the nuances and the details has just been intensified by this episode, bro. Yeah. Honestly. No, I hope that it teaches something to everyone out there is that there's a lot more than meets the eye. Yeah. You know, if you go to a restaurant and you sit down and you think, why is this so expensive? Just... Take a look around, see how you feel, you know, live that experience and then right. say, okay, this is why it costs what it costs. And, you know, that everything has a price. Nobody forced you to go there either. It's not like you got dragged into the fucking thing or coerced into it. So if you're going to sit down and you're not okay with the prices of things, keep it to yourself, be an adult. <laughs> and just don't go back or, or or get up. I've seen people get up from a restaurant. And I respect that. Yeah, I respect so it. People open the menu. They close there it up. The people come to a restaurant. They look at a menu. They never say why they leave. We have a lot of assumptions why they leave. And if you left because you don't feel comfortable spending that much money, it's not even whether you have it or not. Maybe you just don't want to do it. You, yeah. you prioritize eating out and spending money differently than other people do. Right. You could be a millionaire, right? And not want to spend X amount of money on a, on a, on a dish. But you're okay with, with buying a $200,000 watch. That's okay. Priorities are different. But keep this shit to yourself, okay? Be gracious and be an adult and just take it easy. Yeah, and appreciate it. Respect the people that are doing this for you because they go through an awful lot. And the other day, they might just need a nice cocktail, but it's Randall Garden. Anything else, Chef? Listen, with all of that being said... We still appreciate you coming over here. Just yo, keep coming. Yo, your diplomacy during this episode, <laughs> low key, has really pissed me the fuck off, bro. I'm trying to yeah. I throw you softballs, like Listen, underhand. Like I'm trying what to pisses continue. I'm trying to continue to make this money. Okay. I respect that. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, respect, I respect that. I respect that. I respect that. I respect that. Guys, thank show. you very much. Thank you, Chef, for coming in. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for listening. It's a pleasure. Don't forget the tip. And we look forward to hosting you again real soon. Take care, everybody. Bye. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe.